Hello and welcome to The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am recording this towards the end of a glorious winter Sunday, one of those days of ice-cold, clear blue sky. I've been out in my own garden, doing some checking up on the plants, making sure they're growing in all the right directions, checking that they're budding nicely. I bought last year a, a Clematis Cartmanii, Clematis Cartmanii Joe, which is the one you see quite often. It's one of those clematis that doesn't really cling, but will will grow like a clematis if you, if you allow it to grow through something. And it's evergreen. And when it flowers, it completely covers itself in white, like someone who has fallen into a, a tub of, of lemon juice and icing sugar and has come out coated. It's a glorious thing where it works, but I planted it in the deepest, darkest, dankest corner of the garden to, to scramble up the side of a shed and a little bit of trellising. And so I was worried that it wouldn't have had enough sunlight last year to start producing the flower buds, but it appears they're there. It's doing it. The world of plants, it never ceases to amaze. So I'm looking forward to a few flowers from that. And I did some other bits and pieces of, of domestic gardening. But we are not here to talk about domestic gardening. We are here to discuss what it's like to be a head gardener in the south of England. We're here to talk about all the things that I have done this week. All of the, the compost making activities that have gone on. The apple pruning. So let's get on and listen to The Week in Gardening. Welcome to the week in gardening, a week that began and indeed ended in mid-January 2019. The calendar is slowly moving onwards and so is the garden. Actually the garden's moving onwards more quickly than one would expect at this time of year. I think that's because the, the temperatures have remained very mild. The week started off particularly mild. It finished, it finished cold, but it started off with, with almost deadly mildness. That mildness that, that tempts things out of the ground when they shouldn't be, when they should be keeping their heads down. It's been very soft and coddling. It feels a bit like a, a war film. And this is that horrible Trojan lull where we all get out the, the cigarettes and the postcards from home and you just know that there's going to be some horrible gas-filled shell coming our way. But we can't think about that. We need to enjoy what we have in front of us. And in front of us on Monday, I had a very friendly chaffinch. Very friendly indeed. I think of chaffinches, well, they're not, they're not shy birds, but they're certainly not blackbird or, or robin-like in their, their adoration of the gardener. But we've got this, this fat little fellow. It's a male chaffinch, so it's got those, those wonderful colours. And he's turned up fairly recently, and I think that he's, he's decided that this is, is his garden. He's been hopping around with his chest puffed out, like someone might do in a nightclub to, to keep you away from from his girl he's been doing that that to to me i think which is great i like to i like to see it it's very cheerful to to work with his company i think the song the chaffinch because chaffinches have the most amazing song he hasn't really started singing yet i think he'll wait until he's he's more in the, the mate attracting period that's something more to look forward to in terms of horticulture the day was one of discovery we discovered an ancient compost heap behind an outbuilding. And this was something that we had viewed as a hummock, a miscellaneous hummock, overgrown with things. It could have been rubble. It could have been old bits of, of scalping. It could have been wood stores that had been grown over and covered in, in leaves and leaf mould. But actually, it turns out to be years and years and years of rotted organic matter. I don't think it was probably a, a compost heap in terms of put your rubbish and your banana peels and your herbaceous clippings into it. More of a leaf mould store. Somewhere to put all of the, the autumn fall out of sight and out of mind. And over years it's rotted down to create this most amazing substance. 
Of course, it's had lots of roots and seeds falling on it for, for many, many years, for decades probably. So it's completely riddled with, with snaking bits of surrounding trees and brambles and ivy. And so we won't use it straight away. It's going to go to a sort of pasteurization process. We'll put it into the main heap, which gets hot enough to cook off all of that stuff. So we did a little transfer and barrowed huge amounts of this stuff down to, to warm the bed for the, the main season compost, which will be coming when the lawns start growing again properly. Because it's, it's mostly leaf mould, it doesn't have that sticky, thick, nutrient-rich quality of some of the compost we've made from grass clippings and lots of green material. It's very dry and friable. You could use it as a perfect soil conditioner, something to, to break up heavy clays. But we'll use it to stop our compost getting too sticky. It's going to be great in there. It's a, it's a starting bonus of lovely, readily available brown matter. It's very exciting, these discoveries. It's sort of like finding some ancient Egyptian tomb, but, um, but of more practical value. Anyway, that was Monday, a day of wheelbarrowing, up and down some quite steep hills. It's very good for leg training. If anyone is thinking of conditioning a rugby team, they should get them on the wheelbarrows. So there's a tip for all of you sports coaches out there. On Tuesday, we performed a, a key horticultural task. There are certain things in the world of gardening that are almost canonical. They are so essential to, to the world of horticulture and what you think about when you think of performing horticulture. Uh, things like pruning wisteria, summer and winter, tying in roses, staking hardy perennials, these are jobs that somehow feel different when, when you're performing them from other jobs. They feel essential, and essential in, in, in two ways. Essential in the fact that they, they must be done, and essential in the fact that they capture something of the essence of, of our job. When, when, when performing them, I don't know, I, I feel more calm and satisfaction, even than normal. It's strange, but, but there we go. And the job that I was performing that, that fit into this category was pruning old apple trees. It is a subject of many internet articles and a subject of many cold-fingered days out in the orchards. We're very lucky to have some good old orchard apples of various sizes, including a couple that are proper, mature, large root-stocked, climbable apple trees. And these are the ones that we were dealing with on Tuesday. I think some of the excitement in pruning apples is that it is a job that has genuine potential for disaster. You can ruin an apple tree by pruning it poorly in a way that you can't ruin a herbaceous geranium by cutting it back badly. If you see a, a badly pruned apple tree where someone has taken off too many of the, the big thick verticals at a strange two-thirds length along the, the bough and it's shot up with all of these unproductive water shoots, you know it's a bad job and the, the tree didn't like it and it's there for all to see. But likewise, a, a tree that has been carefully looked after or is in the process of being renovated, is a joy for, for everyone to see. There is, there is a separate layer of meaning when seeing that tree. That gives the job an excitement because there's tension to it, there's stakes, there is, there is drama in every cut. I think that as with all art, the, the key to the art of apple pruning is to be explicit but not gratuitous. You want to be bold in the cuts you make, but you don't need to make them for the sake of it. There is a, a maxim that you don't want to take off any more than, than a quarter to a third of the canopy in one go. But that doesn't mean you have to take off a quarter. You don't even have to take off an eighth. If the tree is growing well and growing happily, then you probably won't have to do any, any real work to it whatsoever. Our tree did need work, both of them, because they haven't been touched for a very long time. And that's where the, the explicit nature of the cutting comes in. I wanted each cut to be purposeful, and I wanted it to be done at a, at a definite, distinct point. No 
oh, well, this one comes out to about the level the rest of the branches come out to, so I'll cut it there. No, most of the cuts I wanted done on the trunk or a main branch, just where it comes off. When a branch comes off, there's a little thing called the, the, the cuff or the collar, and that's where you get an, an extra ring of growth, a wider point where it leaves, and then comes into a more shapely branch shape. And I was cutting it just there, just, just on the other side of the ring, so it can heal nicely. A branch can, of course, be chopped further up, but it can't be chopped anywhere. It needs to be chopped at a point where, where it splits, or where a very significant side branch comes off. And I think that this, this makes sense. If you think about a large, mature tree, it has put on a lot of wood, and wood is not particularly easy to produce. If it were, then everything would be a tree. Wood is, wood is hard work. You have to make sacrifices to grow it. And if you have spent a very long time, years or a decade, producing this lump of wood, and you have sent it up and out, and it's grown three, four, five, or eight foot, and then is randomly terminated at six and a half foot, you're not going to give up on that six and a half foot. You're going to tell all of those little dormant buds up there to shoot and grow as hard and fast as they can into these water shoots. However, if your branch has been cut at six and a half foot, but there is a side branch at that cut point, then, then the energy needn't go into those buds and those water shoots. It needs to go up and to the end of that branch where there is already more productive growth, more of the fruit bearing type of growth. There is no need for this water shooting nonsense. If you think of the tree as a, as a flow chart, what was the, the energy, the growth energy flowing up to it from the trunk and dividing? It is, like, it is like a liquid rushing upward and dividing at different points. And if at any point the water reaches a major dam, a major cut, where everything has been terminated, that's where you're going to get all of these, these shoots coming off. But if it can flow still sensibly through, through pipes of the right length out to the end of the tree, then it's going to be sensible and happy. That's the way I was thinking about it as I was pruning it. And I hope that that, that makes sense across the airwaves. The branches I was taking off were mainly diseased branches and branches that were, were going in the wrong direction. Branches that were growing into the middle of the tree, essentially, because they're not going to be productive. They're useless. Apples tend to throot on the outside where there is sun and light and where the fruit won't be hidden behind a curtain of old leaves. And if a tree has a branch that has, has grown from an outward growing branch that's decided to grow back inwards, then it's going to put a lot of effort into growing it and it's never really going to produce fruit. So that can come off. And branches that are knocking against each other and getting congested and, and making the whole thing feel a bit overcrowded up there can come off. I don't want to have these trees terminating in some sort of unsavoury frizz of growth and bits and small little useless apples. I want defined branches, each with lovely, well-spaced groups of apples. And hopefully that's what we'll get. Each of the trees I probably took about a quarter off, and then next year there'll be another quarter of the remaining tree off, and then probably another year after that. Then there will be an apple mountain. I don't know what we'll do with, with all of the fruit. These trees will be productive enough to drive down the price of apples, all across the southeast of England. I spend a lot of time in cider country, up in Herefordshire, on the border of England and Wales, and apparently there's lots of, of cider orchards being grubbed up at the moment. They're, they're getting rid of the apples because of that short-lived cider boom, when, when cider was the, the drink of the, the young and fashionable pub garden crowd are past, and there's no need for them anymore which is sad, so, so maybe the Garden Log listeners could, could drink a couple of pints of cider this, this Tuesday and push the apples up, I don't know. Anyway, that was, that was Tuesday. It was a very, very enjoyable day. Most of my days in the garden are enjoyable, you will no doubt have picked up, but this was something special, something different. I think I'll do another day of apple pruning next week. 
So if you didn't leave this episode with a full understanding of how to prune an apple tree, then then tune in again next week when I will use a different range of metaphors to, to try and explain it. Anyway, that was Tuesday. I was punished for, for the joy on Wednesday with a lot of wet weather. Not really big wet weather, but drizzly, persistent wet weather. There's that that wonderful Tudor poem they found in some notebook that mentions small rain. Is it the Western Wind poem and the poet's getting rained on by small rain? That's the poem with, which ends with him wishing that he was in his bed again. Anyway, that's that's the kind of of rain we had. Small rain that makes you want to go back to bed. And I made made it worse for myself by going and cleaning the gutters like an aggravated child who's having a a miserable time and and wants to make it a performatively miserable time to show everyone just how rubbish the time is again sits in the corner on their own or, or sets up camp in the middle of the stinging nettles with a grumpy look on their face i climbed up a ladder in the rain and cleaned out gutters and these gutters were full of compost again it's amazing that you see compost everywhere when you are a gardener I can't remember what that, that famous phrase is, when you've, all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, something like that. Anyway, when you're a gardener, everything looks like compost. The stuff I was hauling out of the drain pipes was mainly beach residue. It was all of the fine uh, leaf casing that comes off when the, when the leaves start to unfurl. They have that sheath that is like the, the little bit of brown around a popcorn kernel. Anyway, that, that kind of material. And all of that's been falling into the gutters for years and years and building up into this good, claggy compost. So I scooped that out and put it into the compost heap with the, the newly discovered heap from Monday. It really can have quite a strong hold, compost. I can see myself turning into one of those people who, who doesn't mind that their, their prize daily has all been killed or their delphiniums got, got snapped off by a, a drunk garden visitor because it just means more compost. And it's very exciting to, to add more and more to the heap. So the, the gutter muck went into the heap. And I did some other bits and pieces on Wednesday, but I really can't remember what they were. I think I wandered around and checked the progress of the bulbs. Oh, and I, I pruned a bit of wisteria because I was on the ladder up on, on the roof anyway. Not a, not a significant wisteria. This is just a little, a little north-facing wisteria, not like the main expanse of south-facing wisteria on the other side of the house. Though it's interesting to see how differently this, this wisteria grows. The, the length of, of um, growth between the flower buds is much, much shorter. The buds are much closer together because the plant has less vigour. But the, the buds between the, the difference between the buds on the on the whippy, tenderly growth growth is much longer because the plant is obviously desperately trying to, to get over the, the obstacle to the light, which in this case is a house, but, but in the wild would probably be a tree. So it's got a slightly different form to it, which is quite interesting. Anyway, that was that was Wednesday. On Thursday I went back to studying, studying the garden history. There was quite a lot of William Kent floating around in the atmosphere that day. I saw some lovely little William Kent sketches, the drawings he did for, for his clients, particularly at Burlington at Chiswick House. And I think I think Kent was probably quite a whimsical fellow. And his drawings are certainly full of whimsy. They're full of, of beguiling satires, seducing seducing ladies and then um and little frolicking rabbits and, and dogs and things. So quite nice to look at. I'll put some pictures up of those on the on the Facebook group. And afterwards I went to Lambeth Palace. I was there to to use the, the library. They've they've got a lot of old manuscripts that end up in the, the Archbishop of Canterbury's care for, for whatever reason. And I, I, I toddled along. It was dark, so I didn't see the gardens. But it reminded me of how good the gardens are. And that if any of the listeners happen to be in London during the the spring to autumn period, I think they generally open on the first Friday of every month. And they're big. They're big gardens for London. They're sort of 11 acres or so. And they're a thousand years old, literally. And there's a fig tree that is probably 500 years old. I think it's Tudor. I think it's 1530s or something. They have it as put in by by one of the, um, the, one of the popes who was knocking around about the time of the, the Reformation. 
I used to work in a little garden attached to the walls of Lambeth Palace, the outer walls, and I would grow campsis, campsis the trumpet vine, up the walls. And occasionally the head gardener who was there at the time would, would turn up with, with plates of this fig from this famous tree. They're really delicious, a kind of pale fleshed fig, very, very white. I think it might even have been a, a white Marseille or some, something very similar to that, but, but obviously of ancient, ancient pedigree. They also used to turn up occasionally with, with quinces, which are more baffling. What do you do with a quince? You can't just, just scrunch it down in the garden like you can a lovely fig. So anyway, that's, that's a, um, a little bonus recommendation. Go to, go to Lambeth Palace if you can. My trip there, by the way, if anyone's interested, was, was very, very productive. I found a sentence, a key sentence that I had been looking for from, from 1713 in this little little scroll. So I can, I can go away with that happy and, and proof, prove all of those people in the world of garden history that something happened three years earlier than they thought. Or, anyway, that was, that was Thursday. It felt like a, a quite a useful intellectual exercise. And I was, I was riding high for a bit. And I came into work on Friday and realised I'd left my belt at home. So I had to hold my trousers up with a piece of blue baling twine. And then I came back down to, to earth and the realities of, of life and physical labour rather quickly. And it was good. It was it was very nice to, to go back to physical labour. I was listening to a podcast. It was the Guardian Audio Long Read, one of the longer longer form articles they have in the Guardian. And it's, it's read out, basically. And this article was about ageing and exercise. And it was studying these, these so-called blue regions and the blue regions are areas of super longevity in the world so cool because these sort of gerontologists who were researching it drew round them in blue the little pockets of rural communities and it seems to be that the the thing that keeps them alive is gentle sustained activity it's not it's not sprinting and it's not heaving huge rocks. It's, it's walking up a hill to get to a field and working all day in that field, then walking back down again. And that's the kind of work that, that one does as a gardener. So hopefully, hopefully that's going to keep me, keep me alive for forever, or at least alive, at least in good health. On Friday, we were doing a strange job, one of those jobs that you can only really do in winter because in summer there's things rushing onwards, the growth, the lawns to be cut, things to be worried about and deadheaded. But in winter you can do you can do odd little jobs. And this job was raising some stepping stones in this vast hosta and allium bed we've got. And this hosta and allium bed, some of you might remember it from I talked about it when I when I planted a river of violas through it last winter. This year no such river, but um it's it's peppered with stepping stones. The stepping stones are used as decoration in winter. They're wonderful pieces of ancient flag, very attractive in their own right, particularly after it's been raining. And in the summer, when, when the hostas need, need fiddling with occasionally, and the, the flowers chopped off when they get raggedy, as hosta flowers do, then it's very useful to be able to skip around the place on these stones without crushing things, without damaging, damaging the hostas' crowns. Anyway, this bed, being a hosta bed, gets utterly spoiled. Every year we give it this lovely duvet of homemade compost. And as such, the, the soil level has risen and risen, and the stepping stones in relation to the soil has sunk. So now the effect is like one of those very comfy and battered old Chesterfield sofas. A Chesterfield sofa in leather that has the buttons the, the pin, pin the, the, the lever down and then those big pads, the diamond pads where the, the stuffing is bulging out and it forms a pattern on it. And we have that in the flower bed with the stones acting as the button and the mulch acting as the bulge. So each of those stones was lifted up and then we packed a load of soil underneath and whacked them down and tamped them in. So now they sit proud of the soil and the effect is, is much better better I think. It comes back to something I talk about quite a lot which is the intentionality of the garden. It looks like we have tried to, to do something rather than something just happening and I know that's not the style that works everywhere and isn't a style that works for, for all people. Some people want a garden that looks as if it, it was just discovered like this, growing wild and romantic. This garden, that, that wouldn't work, particularly this position in the garden. It needs to, to look as if a statement was made somehow, and the, the statement works better with the paving stones raised. 
it was a good day of wheeling barrows back and forth, digging soil, lifting up stones, exactly the kind of thing that will, will keep the, the garden log going until I'm 110 and we're at episode, goodness knows, 8,000 and something. But speaking of which, this is episode 50. So, so congratulations, the 50th week in gardening for, for you to have listened through. Uh, thank you for sticking with it. Anyway, as a reward, let's see if there are any recommendations this week. My recommendation this week is to get out and start smelling things. There are lots of good floral fragrances out in the garden at this time of year. And because they're rare, they don't tend to blend together in that general all garden in the sunshine smell that, that sometimes assaults the nose. So you can actually isolate them and, and almost track them down within the garden. I went to Kew on Saturday, on a very overcast Saturday. I should have saved it for Sunday, which was beautiful. But anyway, I went to queue on Saturday and was guided by my nose to, to the Hamamelis. There's lovely, lots of lots of hybrid. The, the Hamamelis cross intermedia are out in shades of yellow and orange and even, even a, a reddish shade. I think the yellow and reddish shades, I love the little petals. They look like rashes of American streaky bacon. Tiny little rashes. Whereas obviously the, the, the yellow versions look like, look like lemon zest. And the smell is, it's hard to describe. It's a peppery sort of smell. And the other thing that I was smelling was the Chimenanthus, uh, Chimenanthus praecox. There's a cultivar called Grandiflorus that they, they had there in flower in a couple of places. And this smell is fantastic. You can see why it's called winter sweet. The smell is pure bubblegum. It's the kind of smell that the word food, it would be just pure calories and no nutrition. There's no subtlety and depth to it, like with the, the uh, witch hazel. It is just pure sweet fragrance. And I guess, I guess maybe you need to be that sweet to, to make sure a little solitary bee is going to wake up just for you and brave the frigid air. Kew Gardens was full of birds which is not uncommon, the most wonderful, sleek and fat looking pigeons. Because of course this is London, these are the same pigeons as those what live in Trafalgar Square. But these ones have fed on the finest berries, particularly the ones that live around the Hawthorne area, and they look magnificently plump and sleek. There was also lots of, lots of parakeets, as you expect in South West London. And then a huge amount of jays as well. And these were jays that you saw really close, they were not shy at all. They were in fact quite quite inquisitive and seemed keen to, to look at what people were doing, which is which is unusual because you think of the, the jay as, as quite a as quite a shy bird. Anyway, that's my recommendation. Get out and smell some flowers. It doesn't have to be at Q. You can do that in, in any garden. But if you are in the area of Kew, it is it is really nice at this time of year. I also like to go and see the little miniature daffodils coming up and all of the snowdrops and the, the aconites. It's a it's a glorious winter garden, which which people often forget. Lots of dates going on. I think Kew Gardens must be now the epicentre of the the safe date. The the I want to go somewhere where I don't have to drink and we can we can talk about something. It's better than an art gallery because in an art gallery on a first date I imagine you feel rather rather overheard. But but you go to Kew Gardens and then you can wander around and you can have listened to a couple of episodes of the Garden Log. So you know a few plant names and you can say, Well that the hammer melis. Mm, that's yes, that's that peppery fragrance. So yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I'm sure you don't need dating advice from your horticultural podcasts, but um, but there you have it. No other recommendations, I think, this week. Maybe two pairs of socks. I think it's going to get cold. Another hat. Anyway, I think I've got quite a big week of gardening coming up. I'm going to start putting in orders for the new year. Start shopping, buying some trees, some shrubs, some climbers. I need to, to cover some, some newly exposed bits of walls. Lots of, lots of interesting, exciting things. So stay tuned next week to, to hear what's on the shopping list. I hope that you will all have a wonderful week, whether you are gardening or not. And I will see you next time for episode 51 of The Garden Log. Mm -hmm.